number three that begins on page 184 in your hymnal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And he who forgave me and of my sin. Observe a moment of silence to reflect on God's word and examine our heart.
Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of, the, of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us turn off the front side of our worship insert sheet, and we will speak responsibly to gradual. Praise the Lord, all nations. Praise the Lord, and all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come to his glory. The epistle lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no better off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed? the brother for whom Christ died? Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us rise in honor of our Lord and the Holy Gospel. Cried out, 
What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. We now confess our Christian faith, saying together the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things in the world and in the soul, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who lived for us as men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the next one. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, 
Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This is our case. Dear friends, in Christ Jesus, with today being Super Bowl Sunday, and everyone getting ready for the big game, it got me to thinking how much people are fascinated by games. One of the first games that we learn to play is hide and seek. Think about it. It goes all the way back to the peekaboo day games we used to play with our kids. We would hide our face behind our hands and then pop out to surprise little ones and amuse them. As we get, got older, we all remember playing hide and seek maybe with our parents and siblings or with our friends outside. The problem is that hide and seek is a game we continue to play as teenagers and then as adults. We hide our feelings and intentions from others, from our parents, our spouses, our friends, <coughs> often with disastrous results. The most destructive game of all, however, is when we try to play hide and seek with God. <coughs> Not only is it an impossible game for us to win, the longer we play it, the farther we are pulled away from God and from the blessings that he wants us to enjoy in our lives. Today's text is the intro designated for this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. As I said, it comes from Psalm 32, a psalm of King David, where he shares a grateful testimony of joy for God's gift of forgiveness toward those who with integrity confess their sins and strive to follow God closely in their lives. Instead of trying to hide our sins from God, David urges us to join him this morning as he declares, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. One of the truths that scripture, I think, clearly teaches is that you can't hide from God. But that doesn't stop people from trying, does it? It all goes back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Once they disobeyed God by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, they got scared. As Genesis 3 records, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Prior to the fall, they had this beautiful relationship. They were glad to be in God's company, and they eagerly looked forward to it. Now that they had sinned, they hid from God. The people have been hiding ever since. Yet trying to hide from God is futile. You know, it always struck me as somewhat humorous that once they became sinful, Adam and Eve now thought, hmm, let's hide from our all-knowing, ever-present God. He'll never find us behind these trees. That's what sin does. It makes us foolish and somewhat arrogant. Doesn't the Bible make clear that you and I cannot hide from God? Sticking with the Psalms, consider Psalm 139, where again David declares, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I say, surely the darkness shall hide me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Not only can we not hide ourselves from God, we cannot hide our sin. <coughs> Consider Psalm 90. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. 
Or consider Psalm 51. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. We cannot hide our sins from ourselves. So how can we possibly hide them from God? Even the most secret sins that no one else on earth knows. The selfish actions, the deceptive words, the impure thoughts, all of them are known to God. And what we must never forget is how much God hates sin and how much our transgressions can potentially destroy our relationship with Him. Again, listen to Psalm 90. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. It's no wonder we try to hide from God rather than experience His wrath and punishment. What we must realize, however, is that no matter how secretive we are or how hard we try, we cannot hide from God. Having said that, I want to return to Psalm 32 because what David is telling us in our text is that we don't need to hide from God. The sins of King David are pretty much public record, aren't they? They're recorded in the Bible. For the most part, David was a faithful ruler, but he did have his moments, like when he committed adultery, deception, and even murder in connection with his affair with Bathsheba. So with such a checkered past, how was David able to declare in our text with such boldness, I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. He was able to do so because of what he said by faith right after that. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The reason we don't have to hide from God is because with God there is forgiveness. That's what makes Psalm 32 a grateful testimony of joy. David found forgiveness with God, and we can find it too. What we must do is deal with our sins, not, not hide them. We take our sins to God as part of a, a three-step process. The first step is confession. You know, it is by design that when we gather for worship, our service starts with confession. It's because we know that our sins are what create a barrier between us and God. Our sins keep us from enjoying the blessings that God wants us to have. We want to be rid of those sins. So right from the beginning of our interaction with God here in His house, we confess our sins. All of them with sorrow in our hearts. We bring all of our sins to Him. We bring the sinful condition in which we were born, as well as every act of sin that has happened ever since. We bring the sins of doing the bad things we shouldn't do, as well as forgetting to do the good things we should do. We bring the sins we know about and we feel in our hearts, as well as the ones that we have forgotten about. We bundle them all up and confess them to God. We acknowledge our guilt and His right to be angry with us and how He would be justified in punishing us. But then comes step two. Bless step two. In faith, we ask God to forgive us and trust that He will do so. We appeal to God's mercy and grace, the love which He has toward us, which we have neither earned nor deserved, and we appeal to the payment that God has already made on our behalf to satisfy His justice and wrath, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. The trust we express as Christians is not in anything we do, but always and only in what Jesus did for us at the cross. <clears throat> at the cross, Jesus, who was sinless, became sin for us, taking on the whole ugly, despicable, 
load of our sinfulness. At the cross, Jesus endured the full outpouring of the Father's wrath, crying out at one point, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the cross, our Savior used his own body and blood to make full payment for our sins. The same body and blood that we will shortly partake of in Holy Communion to assure us that full forgiveness is ours. Through his death and then through his resurrection, Jesus Christ made forgiveness available for all poor, miserable sinners like us. In faith, we then go on to step three, which is to repent of those sins through the working of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works through the gospel. He works through Holy Communion. He works through reminding us of our baptism. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, our faith is made strong. Strong enough so that we might renounce those sinful acts into which we have stumbled. Strong enough to turn away from them. And strong enough to pledge with God's help not to do them anymore. Confess, trust, and repent. These are the three steps to dealing with our sins. And we do this not just on Sundays, but every single day of our lives. Sometimes several times throughout the day. It is a simple formula, but it is one packed with blessings. Which leads me to a final point that David makes in Psalm 32. Each of us is to realize anew that you can't hide from God. That you don't need to hide from God. But even more so, that you don't want to hide from God. Why try to hide from God and miss out on all the blessings that he offers? David writes in our text, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And David goes on to mention some of those blessings, like the peace that God offers in his presence. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Think of it this way. Instead of hiding from God, we should seek to hide in Him. We seek Him in prayer, and we are comforted in knowing that He is with us always. He is strengthening us for whatever temptations we must face or whatever trials we must endure. There is peace and joy to be found in God's presence, as well as a love that is awesome to experience. Our intro begins and ends with these words. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the ones who trust in the Lord. Reverend Herman Tice, in his book, Life with God, shares the following perspective on the game of hide and seek. It is in a chapter he calls, People Hide, God Seeks. Religion is commonly regarded as an activity that begins with people. It is regarded as a person's search for God. The Bible rules out any such activity on the part of people by saying that they are dead through sin. Instead, it tells the story of God's search for people. The God of sacred scripture is the giver of life. He is the converter who turns people around. The regenerator who performs the miracle of a new birth by which a person enters the kingdom of God. If a person's religious problem may be compared to the children's game of hide and seek, then God is the one who is designated as it. May he win the game with us by finding us and showing himself to us as our loving Father who has a wonderful life to share with us. A life, I might add, where you do not have to hide from God in fear but can boldly and confidently approach him in prayer saying, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and know that he will always, always forgive you the iniquity of your sin. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding
understanding. May you keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you for having heard our prayers on behalf of your servant Peggy. 
who has been declared cancer free. We are grateful for the doctors and procedures which have helped to make this come about. Now we ask that you bless her continued recovery, restoring and keeping her in health and strength according to your good and gracious will. O Lord, look down from heaven. Behold, visit, and relieve your servants, Helene, Edith, Henry, Maynard, Jan, Kim, and Jim, for whom we pray. Look upon them with the eyes of your mercy and let them find comfort and peace in you. Defend them from every danger in body and soul. Keep them through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for your servant, Jill Schmidt, whose time in this world seems to be drawing to a close. We know that you hold her in your loving, protecting hand and that no one can snatch her away from you. Grant her a blessed end, we pray, and receive her to the mansion that you have prepared for her in your heavenly kingdom. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> the Lord be with you. substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
join in singing the new commitments.
Instead, let's hide in him. 